Yeah, my book is basically about the value divides in, in modern societies. I focus a lot on Britain, but I think a lot of it applies to America too. And I'm talking about not so much the kind of elite, non-elite divide. When we talk about elites, we often mean, I think, you know, the top three or five percent of the population. I'm talking about a much bigger divide between the educated and often mobile people who I call the anywheres, who tend to value openness, autonomy, fluidity, they can surf social change comfortably, they tend not to have strong group attachments. They are about 20-25% of the population, at least in Britain, possibly similar proportions in America. Then on the other hand you have the somewheres, they tend to be about half the population, so a bigger proportion of the population but much less politically and culturally influential. They tend to be less well educated, they tend to be more rooted to places, they tend to value security and familiarity and they find social change harder to, to, to surf and they also tend to have much stronger group attachments. There's also a very useful distinction that parallels my anywhere-somewhere distinction that comes from the American sociologist Talcott Parsons, talking about human identity. He talks about people with achieved identities and ascribed identities. We all have a mixture of the two, but anywhere tend to have a higher proportion of their sense of themselves that comes from their own achievements. They passed exams when they were young, they've been to good universities, they have more or less successful professional careers. So their sense of themselves is more kind of portable. They can fit in anywhere. Whereas if you're a somewhere, a bigger proportion of your identity is linked to particular places and groups and therefore is more easily discomforted when those groups or those places change as a result of immigration or just, or just social change in general. So I think what, obviously a lot of, a lot of contemporary analysis is focusing on this, the, the educated versus the less educated divide. I think what is, what is distinctive about my my look at things is, is stressing both how large the, the, the educated group is and, uh, and how dominant in, the, in our political system it has become, but also focusing on, on two things that distinguish the, the so-called anywheres from, from the somewheres. Uh, one is attitudes, feelings about social change, on the one hand relatively positive, on the other hand pretty negative and also feelings ab about group attachments on, on attachments. On, on the case of the anywheres, pretty, pretty weak, and in the case of the somewheres, much stronger. And, and this, I think, has a huge impact on, on politics, on divisions. So, so anywheres, both of right and left, tend to stress a, a politics of equality, kind of more universalist equality, um, a sort of horizontal politics, if you like, whereas somewheres tend to stress uh, group attachments and, and more kind of vertical, vertical communities, if you like. I mean, one thing it, one must stress here is that both of these worldviews are completely legitimate. Both of them are completely decent, um, at least in their mainstream variations. Um, but the problem for our politics in in modern liberal democracies is that these worldviews conflict in certain fundamental ways um, and or, I mean I'm, 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 I'm an anywhere myself, I mean you know, most, of, most of the people watching this will be anywheres, um, but I think anywheres ha have over dominated politics and somewheres have felt excluded and that has created the instability that has led to Brexit in Britain and, and Trump in the United States and I think we need to take those, uh, those political events as a kind of warning a kind of you know a kind of early tremor uh, of what of what might come, and we need to adjust. We need to we need to create a politics in which somewheres feel they have a louder voice and feel that their priorities and their intuitions are taken seriously. Because I mean, I spend some time in my book just going through the extent of the domination of our of, of the political and policy agenda in, in a country like Britain. I think it applies to America too of anywhere priorities. If you look at everything from the economy to education policy to family policy, to attitudes to social mobility and the, and the, and, and the achievement society, it, we have created societies in which cognitive ability has become the kind of gold standard of human esteem, uh, human measurement. And uh, a lot of people, well, by definition, half of the population are always going to be in the bottom half of the cognitive ability spectrum.
Um, but even people who are not in the bottom half of the cognitive ability spectrum, I think often feel rather alienated by a society dominated by cognitive elites who perhaps feel less, uh, less attachment to duty to um, non-elites than um, they are less paternalistic than, uh, than previous generations of elites. Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting questions is why is this happening now? I mean, on the face of it, you might say that you know, society has always been divided to some extent between the highly educated and mobile people with perhaps more, more open minds and, and, and more rooted people with um, more, um, more scepticism about the outside world. But why, why, is this, uh, why is this now risen to such an important place in our politics? I think there, there are two reasons for that. Um, one is that, and this is particularly true, I think, of Britain and Europe, one is that the, uh, the framework of politics until quite recently has been essentially socio-economic. It's been the, the, the key blocks have been social classes. The issues have been about um, size of the state, um, attitudes to equality and inequality. These have been the themes that have dominated British and European politics. In the last generation or so, you've seen the emergence of what one might call socio-cultural politics, politics that stresses issues of security and identity. Uh, and that's relatively new in Europe. It's perhaps not so new in America. Religion and race has always played a bigger role in American politics than it has in, in, in Europe, at least recently. Um, so I think you've seen socio-cultural politics emerging to kind of challenge uh, the, the traditional dominance of socio-economic issues. Uh, and that is in itself partly a reaction to the much greater openness of our economies and our cultures over the last 20 or 30 years. It's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a reaction against that openness that you've seen the socio-cultural um, politics emerging so strongly. And the second reason is that the, is simply that the number of anywheres has grown quite dramatically. I mean, if you just go back 50 or 60 years, uh, you know, American common sense was essentially somewhere common sense. British common sense was essentially somewhere common sense. It is now in the public realm almost entirely anywhere common sense. Um, you know, what it is to lead a good life, an achieved life, is about being an anywhere. It's about leaving. It's often about leaving your hometown going to a good university, becoming a member of the kind of upper professional class, you know, being part of that cognitive elite. Um, and it's kind of logically impossible <laughs> that everybody can do that. Um, not everybody can join the upper professional class. And I think we've, we've kind of eroded the stories for, for people who are not part of that, that successful achieved group. And you see it also in the way in which um, you, know, you know, we talk about the knowledge economy. I mean, a, a knowledge economy by definition is one that, 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 that is beneficial to the highly qualified. And at the same time, as we've seen the emergence of the knowledge economy, we've also seen the disappearance of so many of those middling jobs that used to give people status and protection. Um, and somebody said to me the other day, actually I didn't write this in the book, but it's something I've learnt um, um, talking about the book, is uh, somebody who, who used to be a, a manual worker said that um, so many jobs used to, used to require not a huge amount of cognitive ability, but a lot of experience to do well. Um, and, that, and that I think applies particularly to the kind of skilled um, manual manufacturing jobs that we've lost, lost in uh, so many of. Um, and that, and jobs that, you, know, you, you, you couldn't just walk in off the street, you know, as a kind of successful Harvard graduate or whatever and do that job. There was, uh, there was a protection to your status for the fact that it required a lot of experience to do well. And, um, and I think we've seen that kind of replicated. We've seen a kind of draining away. This is so much more, I think, about, you know, this is Weber, not Marx. I and mean, this is so much more about uh, issues to do with status and recognition and what one might call, it sounds rather old fashioned, what might, one, one might call social honor uh, that, that people f used to feel they had doing ordinary middling things that they no longer feel they have. They feel that the kind of status, it's not just, a, now we've also had stagnant wages, particularly in America for uh, a, a generation or more, exacerbated obviously by the, by the financial crash. Um, but it's not, certainly in Britain and Europe, I, th I don't think this is primarily an economic issue. It's much more a cultural issue, um, much more to do with status and recognition. Obviously the two things are very 
are very tightly wound up together in, in, in many cases and rather hard to, to disentangle. Mm -hmm.